Hello. I haven't made a video in a while, so I thought I'd make one here. We'll see how long it goes. I get a drink of water here to wet my whistle. Um, today I kind of wanted to talk about um, the word God. Um, you know, the question becomes, um, are you a God? What is a God? Is God a name or is it a title? And um, it's pretty quick we can learn that the name or the word God, uh, El or Eloha or Elohim in Hebrew or Theos in Greek, um, regardless of what word you use in your language for God, the meaning of it is it's a title. It's not a name. Um, and so in order to understand what a God is, uh, that title, what what is that? Um, we obviously, a lot of people think of a God as something that you, you can't see. It's some deity that is beyond. Um, and then there's the ancient, what we think of as ancient deities, you know, like uh, um, Baal Nimrod or, um, you know, Apollo or Zeus or, you know, uh, Horus or Isis, uh, goddesses and, and things like that. But were those something those people couldn't see or were those men? And that's the question. So the first place I want to go is um, online to a biblical concordance. And we're going to just look at a few verses here and then we'll break them down. Now this is from 1 Corinthians 8.5, I believe. This is the Apostle Paul writing and, he, and it's highlighted here. Uh, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be God's many and Lord's many. And this word Lord is also a title. That one's pretty easy. It just means master. It'd be a better translation for us today in modern English to say master. So a Lord is a master. And this God thing, okay, what, what is that? Now, would you believe that the Bible, um, Jesus himself, even said, we're going to, on in John 10.34, let me find that, I think I have it here. Here we go. I'll explain that out a little bit here. In John 10.34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Huh. Now I'm going to pull, I forgot to pull this out real quick. While we're looking at that, let me see if I can find that in this version of the Bible, because I like this one here because it gives you the, uh, um, anything that's quoted from the Old Testament is in bold. So if we scroll back here to 1034, oh, here we go, 1034, and it's Yeshua, not Jesus, his Hebrew name, Yeshua, answered them, is it not written in your own Torah, I said, you are Elohim. And that's quoting uh, Psalm 82.6. So let me go back here and we'll click this on this concordance here. And you'll see there's Psalm 82.6. Let me scroll up here. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. And again, now, if we scroll down here to the breakdown of this, I have said, ye are all gods, and that's Hebrew word 430, Elohim. So, again, this word that's translated God, Elohim, El, the root being El, the Aleph and the Lamed, Eloha in the singular, is a title. Now, what does this title represent? So if we click on this, let's see what it, how it breaks it down. First off, it'll so, this will tell us that how many times it's used in the, with the various English words. Now, capital G God, it's 2,346 times. Lower G God, 244 times. Judge, five times. God, all capital, one time. Goddess, great, mighty, angels, exceeding. God word, godly. Now look at this. In the plural, what is A? Rulers and judges. Divine ones, angels, gods. So are you 
the ruler of your own life? Do you judge? Do you make the choices all the time? So, and, and can you even come together in a social setting to judge others? Um, so, like in a jury, absolutely. So now we can see that this title God, or El, Elohim, Theos, is, is a title that represents a ruling power, a judge. And that's why the uh, Yeshua or Jesus said, doesn't it say in your law that ye are gods? Now it says it in a couple other, whoops, it says it in a couple other places here. In the book of Isaiah, at verse 41, 23, show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods, yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. So again, here's this reference to men being gods. And indeed we are. We are. But let's let's dive in a little bit deeper. What? And let's look at the, the uh, Greek version real quick before we dig a little bit deeper. The Greek word is theos. And we can see in the New Testament, which is the Greek, you see that same God with the capital G 1,320 times, lowercase g 13 times, godly three times, God word, uh, miscellaneous five times. So if we scroll down here, they're a little more on the high side of a God, goddess, general name of deities or divineness, a Godhead, Trinity, God the Father, Christ, Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. His counsels, interests, things due to him. Uh, God's representative or vice regent. And then we see finally magistrates and judges. So again, kind of the same. And in fact, if you went into an ancient Greek court, you would address the judge as Theos. We in most American courts today um, say your honor. Again, it's a representing the office of authority that's making a judgment over us. If a judge in a local magistrate court or a district court judge or a federal judge or so, you know, whatever, um, we always say your honor. But in ancient Greek courts, you'd say theos, uh, God. You, you know, you would, uh, or and in some in some cultures they say your worship. Well, a worship means in the Greek is proskunio, and that means to kneel down and kiss the hand of. That's your worship. So homage, when you show homage to a superior, you're, you're, that's your worship. Um, so in some cultures, they call judges and rulers your worship as a title. Um, here we say your honor, and in the ancient Greeks would say theos. Um, so let's break this down a little further. And I've, I've got this ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, Hebrew letters, words, roots defined within their ancient cultural context. So I got a couple of little markers here. We'll go, and this is at the, whoops, this is at the very beginning. And I thought this, I'd share this part first because it's kind of interesting. Just the constructed, the reconstructed alphabet. Now this book is by a gentleman by the name of Jeff A. Benner. And he's got a YouTube channel I highly recommend. He's actually got a, a video, and I'll see if I can't link it to this video. Um, he does a very good job of pointing out, um, and maybe we'll get a little of that into this video here in case you don't go see it. But um, in the Hebrew text, where Jeff breaks it down, is there's a, when Moses comes down supposedly after meeting God up on the mountain, and... Um, it says he has, in the literal Hebrew, it says he has horns, like a cow's horns, or steer horns, you know, bull horns. And they've changed it in English to say like his face shone, like it was radiant. But the actual Hebrew text says he has horns. Now, you're going to understand why he had horns here in a second. In fact, Michelangelo actually depicted Moses with horns on his head. There's a sculpture of Moses that has, um, by Michelangelo, that has, he actually has, has horns on his head. Now you're going to see why here as we break this down. So let me zoom in here a little bit closer. The original pictograph, now we're talking about the letter, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is our A, is Aleph, or Alpha in the Greek, okay? 
So our this is the same in our alphabet today, the A. Uh, the original pictograph for this letter is a picture of an ox head. And here we can see a little representation of it. What's on the no, what's on the head? Horns. Representing strength and power from the work performed by the animal. How about man being the animal? How about representing the strength and power from the work performed by man? Could a, could a leader, could a ruler have horns? Are you starting to see why Moses had horns? Was he the leader of Israel? Did the people look to him as their leader and their judge? In human form, yeah. This pictograph also represents a chief or other leader. When two, when two oxen are yoked together for pulling a wagon or plow, one is the older and more experienced ox who leads the other. Within the clan, tribe, or family, the chief or father is seen as the elder who is yoked to the others as the leader and teacher. The modern name for this letter is Aleph. And here it's spelled out in the ancient Aleph, Lamed, Ayin. And corresponds to the Greek name Alpha and the Arabic name Aleph. The various meanings of this root are oxen, yoke, and learn. Each of these meanings is related to the meanings of the pictograph ox, Aleph, A, Aleph. The root of the word Aleph is an adopted root from the parent root L or Al, L, meaning strength, power, and chief, and is the problematic, thing, or probable, sorry, probable original name of the pictograph, Aleph, the ox. The Lamed is the shepherd's staff. Now that looks like a J, but it's not. It's actually would be our letter L today. Now the reason for that is in Hebrew, everything is active. So when we think, a lot of people think of a shepherd's staff as the shepherd holding his staff where the crook or the hook is on top when he's idle. But when you're, when you're actually working or doing action with the shepherd's staff, the hook or the crook is down in the sheet. So they would always draw it with the crook at the bottom because that represents the action of using the shepherd's staff to hook the sheep, to stop the sheep, or to tap them on the rear to get them to go this way or that way. This represents the power of the shepherd over the sheep. Um, and we'll see that. The shepherd's staff, the Lamed, is a shepherd's staff and represents authority as well as a yoke. See lamb below. Combined, these two pictographs mean strong authority. The chief or father is the strong authority. The L can be understood as the ox and the yoke. Many Near Eastern cultures worship the god L, most commonly pronounced as L, and depicted as a bull in carvings and statues. Israel chose the form of a calf, a young bull, as an image of God at Mount Sinai, showing their association between the word El and the ox or bull. The word El is also commonly used in the Hebrew Bible for God or any God. The concept of the ox and the shepherd's staff and the word El has been carried over into modern times as the scepter and crown of a monarch, the leader of a nation. These modern items are representative of the shepherd's staff, an ancient sign of authority, and the horns of an ox, an ancient sign of strength. So, if we go back to the actual dictionary entry for L, we see the action, the action definition is a yoke, 
the concrete definition is an ox, and the abstract meaning is strength. The pictograph of the ox head is a picture of an uh, aleph, is a picture of the ox head and also represents its strength. And the lamed is a picture of the shepherd's staff and also represents authority of the shepherd. Combined, these two pictures mean the strong authority and can be anyone or anything of strong authority. The yoke is understood as a staff on the shoulders. See Isaiah 9.4. In, in order to harness the power for pulling loads such as a wagon or plow. Hence, the two pictographs can also represent the ox and the yoke. Often two oxen were yoked together. Although we did that and I covered that. So let's go over here to where it actually is the plural for Elohim. So the power or might of one who rules or teaches one who yokes with another, often applied to the to rulers or a god. Okay, so now are you starting to understand why Yeshua, Jesus, said in 1032, Jesus answered them and said, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods, ye are elves, ye are Elohim. You have this title of a mighty authority. And now we can start to understand Paul when he's talking about for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Ooh, okay. <laughs> now, exp now remember when G I'll pull this one up here. Let me just open up another, open up another tab here. Let's put in call no man father in the search engine. Call no man father. See what comes up. In Matthew 23, 9. Remember what we just read in this ancient Hebrew lexicon about the chief or the father being this L, right? In Matthew 23, 9, it says, this is now Yeshua saying, And call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Now, are we talking about your natural daddy here? Or are we talking about all these substitute fathers, these gods, many, that Paul's referencing in 8. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Would the state government, would the president of the United States, would the Roman emperor, would uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, would the governor of your state, would a local magistrate or a district court judge or a federal judge or any mighty authority that has power to rule over you or judge you, would those be gods? Would those technically be your father? If you w look back at the very first video I made in this series under parents Patre, government as father. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. You see, in the state of nature, you are to be the God that rules and judges your own life. And you don't have any authority to rule or judge over another man unless they contract with you into such a position. Now, you've done that. You've contracted into a position with government for it to be your father through your birth certificate, your citizenship, your social security number, your licenses like marriage license, business license, driver's license, hunting license, occupational license, professional, radio like blah, 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 blah. Call no man father upon the earth. Ooh. So a God is a mighty one of authority. An El, a Theos. It's a ruling judge. It's a sovereign power. It's a government leader. Just, it's also a father. It's also you. 
anytime you, it's a lawmaker, if you make a contract with somebody or you sign a contract, more like an adhesion contract, maybe you don't write the terms and conditions, but like your credit card, maybe you just sign that contract after reading it and you're agreeing to all those terms and conditions, that makes that contract law for you. You're making law. That's your that's your power, your higher power as a God. Doesn't it say in your law, ye are gods? Jesus answered them. Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Remember what was that? Where was it? I have, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So, wow, okay. Well, what happens if we compare this now? Scroll down here. I didn't open this one up yet. I want to give you uh, some uh, things to think about here. Oops. There's the Lord. Okay. Now, I think even Christians will agree that the Ten Commandments <laughs> have not been done away with. Most Christians think that the, most of the Torah from Genesis 1-1 through the end of Deuteronomy have been nailed to the cross. Somehow, magically, this somehow didn't get nailed to the cross. Um, I, I don't understand their, their gobbledygook, but um, let me blow this up a little bit because this is kind of small. And we're just going to kind of focus on the top three here. We'll blow those up for make it easier to see. Now with this understanding of the of the word God, I've I've replaced this and made this if we were going to write it today with what we've learned what God means. Ye shall have no other gods, right? That's what we think it says. We shall have no other gods. How about ruling lawmakers and judges in place of or in front of Yahuwah, the only true lawmaker and judge? Uh-oh. Ouch. So if you've bound yourself to a ruling earthly power like the United States or the state of California or the state of Texas or the state of Germany or the European Union or Russia or China or whatever. Are you in violation of this first commandment? Ye shall have no other ruling lawmakers. You shall have no, don't call any man father upon the earth under parents patre. Government is father. And judges in place of or in front of Yahuwah, the only true judge. Okay, how about number two? What's the second commandment? about we write it correctly, you shall not create, build, or institute man-made systems and surrender our God-granted rights, powers, and authority, remember, you are God, to those systems as a substitute for this unseen creator God ruling in your conscience, in your heart and mind. We shall not go under the authority in service of ruling lawmakers and judges, civil civil powers of the Nicolaitan. What does that word mean? Nico is is uh, like Nike. It's to conquer or be the victor. And Laetan is people. Laity is people. So a Nicolaitan is somebody who conquers or has victory over people. And the same for the Hebrew ba Balaam. Balaam. Okay, Baal is the root of the word Lord. It's the same word in Hebrew, Baal or Lord, Master. And again, Am is representing people. So this is the Lord over the people. 
So the victor or the ruler over the people, the conqueror of the people, the Lord of the people. We shall not claim faith in Yahuwah while living by faith, allegiance, fidelity, and showing and pledging allegiance to or trusting in the ruling lawmakers and judges of the earth. So how many people that are running around there calling themselves Christians and Jews or even Muslims who claim to have Allah as the supreme God? How many of them have pledged allegiance to these, to these earthly gods huh? in violation of these commandments? Huh. Interesting, huh? So, one, a god is a mighty, mighty one of authority a lawmaker, a ruling judge, a sovereign power, a father, uh, and those can be civil powers that are substitutes. The surrogate father of the state under parents patre, the lawmakers and judges of the civil body politics that you contractually bind yourself to to obey. And people were doing this. That's why God said, you shall have no other gods. This is why um, uh, Joshua said, uh, you know, told the people before they crossed over into the promised land. Are you going to serve the gods, the ruling powers, the sovereign powers of the Gentile or pagan nations of the earth that your fathers ruled on the other side of the flood, like Egypt, you know, Persia, Babylon, you know, all of these, uh, uh, you know, the city-states of... of uh, Babylon, Tyre, Sidon, you know, the Palest um, the, the Philistine authorities, all, you know, all those civil powers. Are you going to worship those gods, those Baals, those lords, those masters, those, those ruling authorities? Or are you going to worship this one God that wants to rule in your consciousness, not as a direct ruling authority where you maintain this power as a God created in the image of this God? but you don't rule over your neighbors, only yourself. You only rule over yourself and you let everybody else rule over themselves. But see, that's why we bind ourselves to these because we don't want to do that. We want to use the power of the state in our sloth, in our fear, in our envy and jealousy and greed and lust to use the power of the majority to rule over the minority who join these body politics. And we take from them. We steal and covet. And we use the power of the state to do so. If you don't think so, just look at how public schools are financed. Just look at how public schools are financed. I've got a document here to kind of show you. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Public education, the 10th plan, here we go. Public education, public schools is the 10th plank of the Commerce Manifesto. Okay, so the average cost per student in the U.S. public school ed education system in 2015 was $12,000 per year per student. Public school education is usually paid for by an excise tax, a tribute, on real estate. The legal title holder, the trustee of the state Sesti Key Trust property, some of the pledged collateral of the national public debt. Average property tax bill on your house in the U.S. in 2015 was around $3,000 per year. Do you see the deficit? If you have one kid in school, if a U.S. person, a 14th Amendment U.S. person with a federal citizen holds legal title to real estate, and is raising one of the state's kids with a birth certificate, then the legal parent, the legal guardian, or the legal title holder of the real estate is only discharging about a fourth of his child's public school education. Right? 12 grand a year, and he's only paying three grand. Where's the other three fourths coming from? Where does the other three fourths or nine thousand dollars come from? The neighbors in your local school district. This is a violation of the covetous and stealing prohibitions of the law of God. If the U.S. if a U.S. person has two of the state's children in the public school system, 
that's a total bill of twenty-four thousand dollars per year, but he still only pays the three three thousand dollars of the real estate tax. So where's the other twenty-one thousand come from? More neighbors. <laughs> so you can see that this system of civil law is this adversarial or satanic system that causes you just by your direct part participation you violate every law of the law of god the law of nature and nature's god when you participate in the civil law system you surrender your power of being a god a mighty authority to take care of your own children you provide 100 percent of the education they need you train them up. The Bible tells you to train your children up according to the law of nature. But you don't want to do that. You don't want to take the time to do that. You want to go work in commerce and get paid a salary and income through commercial means and then pay, have the state tax everybody uh, and you equally, you know, it takes a village, as Hillary Clinton said, for you to uh, raise up the children in public schools. And that causes you to violate all of the laws oops, of the Ten Commandments. So let's let's see what the rest of these say. Let's uh, we'll uh, uh, oops, scroll down here. How about the covenant one? We shall not we shall not desire the rights and dominion over or within any other man's family. We shall not desire to use anything that is properly in the custody and possession of others. This is coveting. If we have become bound by the acts and deeds of our ancestors and our own acts and deeds, then we uh, uh, not just undo those acts by running away in unrighteousness. We must honor our agreements and contracts, covenants and constitutions, and if private and or public debt is involved, we must pay the debt. Pray for post limine the death of the husband or father or a lesser spirit we are bound to or wait for the husband or father to release us. Now, that's what we're talking about. The, the husband and father of the United States has already written into his laws he, to release you. But you don't know that. That's what this whole video series is trying to show you. You have the power to take back this authority of being a god, but you have to give up this system that you're bound into. Okay, you gotta walk away from that in many ways. You can still engage it, but you gotta be righteous with it. Okay. So number six here, we shall not take by force, fraud, legal plunder, deception, or negligence any part of another man's life or liberty. This is murder, slow murder. You know, we always think of murder as, you know, you just stab a knife in somebody's heart and they die or shoot them in the head and they fall over dead. But you can kill somebody over a long period of time. So as you slowly suck the life out of your neighbors, just like in that public school example, you're slowly murdering them. You're taking their life from them against their will. Now, they're also participating in the same system, so they're sucking the life right back out of you, <laughs> you know. Um, it's a vicious, the Bible talks about that too. You're living in a cauldron where you're backbiting each other in these civil systems. Okay? So there you have it. A God is a title. God is a title. It means a mighty one of authority. And there's gods all over. In fact, if you ever go to Washington, D.C., let me type in here real quick into a search engine. The Apo, oops, try to type here by holding the camera. And everything apotheosis is a process of raising somebody to a god and let's oops I feel, oh here we go there it is the apotheosis of Washington <laughs> I think let me let me put that in there um, if you ever go to the capital in the United States uh, DC apotheosis of Washington in fact, the, did you know that the U.S. presidents held the same offices as the Roman emperors, the Roman kings? They held um, the office of Apotheos, which is the originator or appointer of gods. Remember, what's a god now? A judge. 
So does the U.S. president, through the Constitution, have the power to appoint or name, um, nominate federal judges? Yeah. So he's the apotheos. He can, he can name uh, the federal judges. Okay. Um, the U.S. president also has the, the, the office of imperator, which is the commander in chief. And then he's also the uh, principal civitas or president, first citizen of the nation. So here you see a picture. This is from the Capitol Dome. This is a fresco painting. Um, and it's the apotheosis of Washington, painted in 1865 by Constantine Bermudi. Or Bermudi. Uh, the apotheosis of Washington in the eye of the U.S. Capitol building's rotunda depicts George Washington rising to the heavens in the glory flanked by female figures representing liberty and victory, fame, and surrounded by six groups of figures, blah, blah, blah. So I, I you know, you go read about that, but, you know, there, there you have it. George Washington was an apotheos. Um, remember, you're a theos if you want to take that power back. If you want to be your own god again, you can the question is, is are you wanting to, can, do you want to just give that power of being a God to some other human for them to judge and rule over you? That's your choice. Are you going to serve the gods your father served on the other side of the flood? Or are you going to serve the God of creation who gave you these laws to, to set you free and make you a free, sovereign individual yourself? Or you only rule over your own life and your family. That's it. Anyway, I hope this helps for you to understand what a God is and how <laughs> there's gods everywhere. Peace.